So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Lord, for this, this day, this evening, this Easter season, the beautiful weather, the spring, all the flowers, and just the great temperatures outside. Um, I want to praise you, Lord, for this writing of St. John Paul II. Thank you, uh, all that he's taught. I ask you to send your Holy Spirit that we can understand what he wrote um, about celibacy and what St. Paul wrote about celibacy. Um, please help us to understand this. And we dedicate this evening to our Blessed Mother. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, okay. pray for us. St. John Paul II, pray for us. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right. Good to see you all. Thank you for coming. I will share my screen. Okay, we are almost done with chapter three. Um, we just have this audience and then two more on this topic of celibacy or continence for the kingdom of heaven. We're reflecting on St. Paul's words. Um, and then there's one more audience, number 86. Um, and then we go to part two of theology of the body. So we're about to complete part one. Um, so it's exciting. Good job, everyone. We've made it this far. Um, keep up the good work. So, okay, so we're on, we're on to St. Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about this topic of celibacy. John Paul II has already discussed Jesus's words, first of all, uh, in Matthew chapter 19, when Jesus refers to the three eunuchs. Um, and that some make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So these are Christ's words that spoke, first of all, of the motivation for celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Um, and also of the sacrifice or the travail of such a decision that is like a eunuch, um, which it, it underlines the sacrifice of this choice of life. Um, so now we're on to St. Paul, and St. Paul has, first of all, the example of his own life. He says, I wish all that were like as I am, meaning he is celibate. Um, so he's recommending celibacy off his own personal experience of it. Uh, we also have Jesus's own example of, of celibacy. Um, so let's, let's dive into what St. Paul says. And, um, you know, we're, we're looking at the phrase in particular where St. Paul um, says um, that those who choose marriage do well, but uh, the one who chooses a life of continence or virginity does better. Um, so we're, that's, that's kind of the the phrase we're looking at, but in today's audience, we don't actually get a whole lot into that. Um, but we will talk about some things that St. Paul says in, in this context. Um, so this is, this is one thing he says that I, this is St. Paul. I say this to you, brothers, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And then those who buy as though they had no possessions and those who make use of the world as though they made no use of it. For the stage of this world is passing away. I want you to be free of anxieties. So this term in, the, in this first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians chapter seven, he talks about anxiety quite a bit. And Bill Donahue noted this in his video as well. So here he says, I want you to be free of anxiety. Um, but he'll speak more about anxiety that uh, we're anxious about what is close to our heart. He says, man can in fact be anxious only about what is truly close to his heart. Um, and he says, the unmarried person is anxious about what is the Lord's, how to please the Lord. 
So he's using this anxiousness in sort of a positive way. You know, in our, in our society culture today, if you say the word anxious, it's always in a negative way, um, you know, if someone has anxiety. But St. Paul seems to be using it in a positive way, that the unmarried person is anxious about what is the Lord, so concerned for, totally focused on, absorbed with what is the Lord's um, and how to please the Lord. Well, not only does he, not do she, not only does he formulate the principle and try to explain it as such. So this is St. Paul formulating the principle of celibacy, but he ties it together with personal convictions born from the practice, his own practice of evangelical counsel of celibacy. So St. Paul will talk about celibacy um, and the reasons for it, but also based on his own life experience of living that. And, and he, St. John Paul II calls it the evangelical counsel of celibacy. We remember that celibacy is not a command of Jesus. It's not a command, but it's a counsel. So the apostle, St. Paul, writes to his Corinthians, not only I wish that all were as I myself am. So he's not only saying, just do what I do, but he goes further when he says in reference to those who marry, still those who marry will have troubles in the flesh. And I would like to spare you that. So those who marry have trouble in the flesh. So, so St. John Paul asks, what, what are these troubles in the flesh that St. Paul is talking about? Does this have any sign of Manichaeism that would call the body bad or marriage bad? And St. John Paul II is clear that St. Paul does not have any Manichaean tendencies. So he's not saying marriage is, is bad in any way. But he says that this, what are these um, trials in the flesh that a married couple will have? He says this in this realistic observation, one should see a justified warning for those who think, as at times young people do, that conjugal union in life should bring them only happiness and joy. So marriage is hard. You know, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. So a lot of times young people will have this idealized view of marriage that is going to just be so happy and everything. But it's, it's tough. You know, it's, it's hard. Um, we can only do it with the grace of Christ. So, and these troubles are often trouble. So now John Paul II is getting into what are these uh, trials of the flesh, these troubles. These troubles are of a moral nature. So it's about love. How, how can the couple truly love each other? Um, if he thereby intends to say that true conjugal love, exactly the one in, in virtue of which the man will unite with his wife and the two will be one flesh, is also a difficult love. He certainly remains on the grounds of evangelical truth, and there is no reason to detect any symptoms of the attitude that was later to characterize Manichaeism. So in, in this interpretation, St. Paul would be speaking that married love is difficult. Okay. Um, so now we're going to look at that phrase, the anxious. Um, the unmarried person is anxious about what is the Lord's, how to please the Lord. So the context of the verb be anxious or seek in the Gospel of Luke, who Luke was a disciple of St. Paul, indicates that one must truly seek only the kingdom of God, what constitutes the better part, the unum necessarium. So this is from the Gospel of Luke. Um, that this is the meaning of to be anxious for to be co totally concerned about the kingdom of God. Um, this is what the celibate is called to do, as we're all called to do. We're all called to, to be focused on God as well, but the celibate does it in a unique way, in a special way. Um, so man can, in fact, be anxious only about what is truly close to his heart. And then I just like this quote, and he put an exclamation point. Um, 
so looking at we're being anxious about what is the Lord's and anxious about the Lord and how to please the Lord. So what is the Lord? What, what belongs to the Lord? Well, everything does, you know, God created the whole world. So when the Christian is anxious about what belongs to the Lord, we're really anxious about the whole world. The object of the Christian solicitude is the whole world because God created the world. Uh, the Psalm says the Lord's is the earth and everything in it. Um, so apostolic zeal and the most fruitful activity do not yet exhaust what is contained in Pauline motivation for continence. So these are part of continence um, that they, they stem from apostolic zeal because of his zeal as an apostle wanting to share the gospel. This is a motivation for being continent and also how fruitful his activity can be by being content, by being celibate for the kingdom of heaven. This leads to a very fruitful apostolate, a very fruitful work, much time to devote to work and all that. But this is not the only, this is not exhaustive. This is just the fact that it can bear much fruit is not uh, the sole reason for continence, but it also includes this relationship with God. As we talked about earlier, that the celibate chooses celibacy, first of all, out of a response to God, a response to the love of the bridegroom. Um, that the celibate responds in love with the total gift of self. So the unmarried man is anxious about how to please the Lord. This statement embraces the whole field of man's personal relationship with God, how to please the Lord. Like this, is, this is about our relationship with God. Okay, so that's all from that audience that I have. Um, I have a few announcements. Uh, there's two upcoming Theology of the Body retreats that you're welcome to register for if you'd like to come. One is in Pittsburgh, or outside of Pittsburgh, um, at the end of May and early June. It's a Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, another Theology of the Body retreat in Mexico City, uh, June 10th through 12th. That's a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. That'll include... Um, hiking in the mountains, mass outdoors, and um, a pilg walking pilgrimage to Our Lady of Guadalupe um, Basilica. You're also invited to join us for the rosary um, every night at 9 p.m. on Zoom, and the Divine Mercy Chaplet every day at 3 p.m. on Zoom as well. Um, and finally, if you would like to support me and my mission, you are welcome to. Um, I offer courses for free. I offer things like this for free. Um, but I'm getting ready to go to Ukraine to continue, hopefully continue this theology of the body work. Um, so if you'd like to donate, you can. Um, but I'm offering everything for free. So just if you feel called to support me, um, you are welcome to. All right, so uh, what were your thoughts or feedback to this hey, audience? Nick, real quick, sorry, I was on mute. I have a question about the Mexico City retreat. Yeah, sure. Um, is it the full three days? So like people would need to arrive before June 10th and plan on leaving after June 12th? Yeah, so it'll start like in the morning on June 10th, um, and then it'll end. Uh, I'm, we're not sure on the timing exactly of the start and the ending at this point, but yeah, it'll probably be those full three days. No, I mean, on Saturday, we'd probably not end too late. You know, we might end by early evening or something like that, but yeah. Okay, I'm gonna talk more with you about it. Okay, awesome, yeah. Do you have plans for after nine o'clock on Friday? For, say that again? Do you have plans for after nine o'clock oh, on Friday? For this Friday? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. We can we can talk. Yeah. Okay. We usually have the rosary, but yeah. And nine. But yeah, we should we should find time. Yeah. Okay. So wait, the rosary is at nine every uh, day? Yes. Nine PM? Yes. Cent central. But not time. on Mondays. 
No, every day, even on Mondays. But, oh, wait. wait. Central time. So that's, oh, that's 10 here. Sorry, yes. my brain is, the timing is, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I might be able to do it at 10. I'm okay. actually winding down for bed by then, but. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah, join us. That'd be great. Yeah. For some reason, I can't see the images on my WhatsApp on my iPhone. I'm, I might have my settings. Oh, okay. on that. So, like yeah. So, did did you gain anything from uh, Saint Paul's edition? Now we're we're bringing in. So now we've looked at what Jesus has said, and now we're looking at some of the text of what St. Paul has said about celibacy. Um, so we're, was that helpful? Was that insightful? Are you? Nick, I, I've got a couple of questions. In, in section two, Paul's make, Paul makes the argument that because of his experience, he is sort of well positioned to talk about continence for the kingdom. And mm -hmm. I certainly couldn't agree with that, but I could argue that because of his lack of experience, his ability to talk about marriage is suspect. That would mm -hmm. be point one. Point two in number nine, I guess it's, I'm not sure if it's a quote from either Paul or Pope Paul, uh, and you showed it on your slide, it said the unmarried man, and then it continues man's personal relationship with God. And the way that's worded, because it's talking about continence for the kingdom, it kind of leaves woo man out. That's in nine. Uh -huh. Normally it's worded in a way where you would say it's mankind, but in this case, it's not. It's worded to, to arguably mean male man versus female woman. Huh. What makes you think that? Or why, why is this one different? The unmarried man. You, you, that is not mm -hmm. an unmarried woman. That is an unmarried man, male. Oh, okay. I got you. I, yeah. Even if it, I think we can apply it, though. like it's the same, right? I mean, the truth that he's saying, I think is applied to both, both male and female. Like, I, I'd probably say I don't disagree, but if I were a member of, of the, one of the orders of consecrated women, I would say, wait a minute, why is this worded so patriarchally why is this worded so somewhat anti-consecrated womanly i'm just making that point the way i read it it certainly was maybe it's in the culture of saint john paul maybe it's the translator who didn't translate it correctly but again i think we need to be cautious as we talk about individuals who have continents for the kingdom as either male or female, it's not only, it's just not only priests. Yeah, it's both. But it reminds me of the example, even Jesus used, he said in, in um, the second chapter of Theology of the Body that a man who looks at a woman with desire, with lustful desire has committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus uses the example of a man, of a male. Um, but John Paul II is also clear that this truth can is also vice versa. Women towards men can also have that same look with lust as well. Um, so I think using an example of one doesn't exclude the other, you know. And I agree with you, but remember yeah. that that's where I have an issue with, with John Paul's ancient translation, where he calls the woman in that, uh, that's uh, 527, 28, 
an adulteress, which is obviously not a male. Mm -hmm. I just think it's something we need to be sensitive to as mm -hmm. we look at teachings, whether they're of Jesus or of the uh, early church fathers or of our more recent saints like Pope John Paul. Mm -hmm. Nick Grant, I think that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. But often it gets confusing uh, yeah. how this applies. Is it supposed to be a universal, um, all human beings, which is what I was taught in grade school that the word man meant, or is it specifically for males and not females? So yeah, I agree. It, it is confusing and sometimes uh, people use it one way and sometimes they use it another way. You know, I was thinking about your first point um, and it's true that, that it is a weakness of pastors and priests um, who are celibate that they don't have the experience of what a married person goes through. John Paul II talked about that at the beginning of Love and Responsibility, I think, where he said, like, even though he doesn't have the same experience that married people do, the fact that he's walked with so many of them and has counseled them and has shared life with them, he gets an insight into lots of different people's relationships, which is a really valuable perspective. And I was thinking about the life of St. Paul, how he is probably the same way, because if you like pick up the clues of the story of St. Paul from Acts of the Apostles and his writing. St. Paul was very much a man of the earth, like meeting people where they're at, hanging out by streams, talking where people are washing their laundry, working for a living, making tents, going to do missionary work with husband and wife couples, um, you know, honoring the churches that's at Timothy's grandma's house and just all sorts of things. He was really involved in the life of people. And so I suspect that um, he also had a lot of insight, not personal experience, but insight into what it meant to live the Christian vocation to marriage. Um, he, he even talks about bishops, you know, and how this is what their marriage needs to look, look like, which from our 21st century perspective is kind of judgmental. Um, when we look back, like, hey, if your family's messed up, is it really your fault? <laughs> um, <laughs> St. Paul left that experience, or that advice that a bishop should only be married once. Hmm. Some good points. Nick, I have a question. Nick Kempel. Um, when you were in Austria, your school, you said you were surrounded by um, Byzantine priests. Mm -hmm. So um, their tradition allows for married priests. And yep. um, were any of those priests married? Yeah, they were. They were all married. Um, there, I knew uh, at least three priests that were Byzantine that had families that were there, their wife and kids. Um, and then uh, there were also Roman Catholic priests that were there studying as well. So it was this interesting uh, mix. Every day we had uh, mass, the Roman rite mass, and we had divine liturgy, uh, the Byzantine. Yeah, it was really, it was really eye-opening for me as a Roman Catholic uh, to encounter priests and then see them on the altar and their kids are up there, the altar servers. Uh, with really? Them. Yeah, it's wow. beautiful. And their kids are at the divine liturgy singing and uh, and then to see them afterwards you know having dinner with their family uh after mm. it's really interesting so when you read this um you know these chapters in light of that what 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 are your feelings um i mean i i think all this like teaching it shows the the glory and the dignity of celibacy for the kingdom and and actually so the roman the roman rite chooses its priests from men who have chosen to live a life of celibacy um so the choice for celibacy kind of comes first or it's like a different type of discernment 
and then the Roman right chooses men and the, the Byzantine right choose only chooses bishops from those who are celibate. So um, a visit, a pre, a, they will ordain married men to the priesthood, but not bishops. So they'll only ordain bishops who are celibate. Um, so they also value cel celibacy in the, in the Byzantine Catholic church. Um, and uh, this is also seen in, they also have monks and nuns that are celibate in the Byzantine Catholic um, church. So they, they also value celibacy. And I think all of this teaching um, is applicable there. Um, so celibacy is still very valuable. Yeah. Nick, are the bishops often um, consecrated religious, like monks who were then later chosen? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not really too familiar, Amos. Um, I've only seen like a couple of Byzantine bishops, I think. I don't really know their story, but I that would be a good guess, I think. Because hmm. I know that Callistos Ware, um, who's like in the Eastern Orthodox Church, he's the highest ranking English speaking bishop. I um, mean, he lives in England. Uh, he um, was a, a monk first and changed his name from Timothy Ware to Callistos Ware, um, and then was later made a bishop and arch episcopate or whatever he is now. Hmm. Nick, I just mentioned that some of this that we, we tend to think of as black and white because of various factors quickly becomes gray. In, in the area I am, two of the parishes that are adjacent to ours are, are currently led by priests who were both Episcopal and converted to Catholicism they, be, they, they are Catholic, Roman Catholic priests, but have families. Yeah. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying it gets then quite confusing when you're, you know, teaching faith formation about the priesthood and the child says, excuse me, Father Dimonos, he's got a wife and children. They were at dinner with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I knew when I was in the seminary, there was a, a man, a seminarian who had converted from Episcopalian recently, or not recently, they, won't, they, they take a few years, like after someone converts, before they allow someone to enter the seminary, they, they want them to be Catholic a few years. And um, I think probably, I mean, it's up to the bishop, I guess, but um, that... Uh, so he, I talked to him and there, they, it is just a very special a, a very special allowance of the church, right? For these Anglican converts to, who were working as ministers in their church when they convert to Catholicism, they allow that because I think it just shows that um, priesthood and marriage are not, not um, they're not opposed. <laughs> which we're, we're not used to that in the Roman rite, um, but the dignity of the priesthood, which is holy orders, which is um, someone being ordained in persona Christi to be in the person of Christ. Um, the, the Roman rite chooses this for celibate men because Christ was celibate. That's one reason. So it's an imitation of Jesus. And um and for all the reasons that we've been discussing from the theology of the body that John Paul II has been explaining why celibacy is a good thing. Um, but it doesn't have like priesthood can also be with the married life as, as we see from uh, the Byzantine Catholic church that it, that it is possible. Um, but the Roman rite chooses this discipline because of the value of celibacy. I think Nick Grant is right um, that too often, like children and even people who aren't super well informed about their faith, think of celibacy and the priesthood as integrally related, like you need to have one without the other. And the truth is that the teaching of the church is that celibacy is a gift. It's a vocation and a calling. And the priesthood is a gift. 
a vocation and a calling. And those two gifts don't have to go hand in hand. Um, but it seems like an even greater gift when they do, simply because of the demands of the priesthood. Um, but, but Nick is right. Like we need to like reset our mindset about how we see these things and their integral relationship. I mean, I think of like the, the, cel the celibate priest that I know they're, they're able to be almost like a spouse to their parish, right. In a certain way, like, like Christ is the spouse of the church. So in a spiritual way, in a, they're, they're called the spiritual fatherhood, right. To be, to be spiritually father. So as a celibate, they're able to do this with like an undivided heart. Um, because, you know, the Byzantine priests, they have their parish, they take care of their parish, but they also take care of their family mm -hmm. um, and their, their wife and kids. So they're, 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 and they have a full schedule. You can just say that, um, just like Roman Catholic priests do, but yeah. celibates are kind of more free. Yeah. I don't know if anybody follows um, Father Thomas Loya. He's um, a TOB priest, a Byzantine priest. Um, his explanation um, is, I mean, he has uncles that are um, Mary that are Byzantine priests and um, he was saying that he is not married but he was saying that um, the, the the women that are wives of Byzantine priests by and large are there's kind of a position in the um, for the wives of the priests and so I'm curious if you observe that like it's sort of like she's kind of the the mother figure in the in the Byzantine or the, is it called a parish so mm -hmm. she she kind of has a, a role a motherly role in the parish um my personal experience the ones I've met it didn't feel that way I'm not saying that that doesn't happen maybe it mm -hmm. does I don't know um okay. but the one the, the, my experience of like um, there was a, a parish priest I know that it just seemed like he was really in charge of the parish and the wife had kind of nothing to do with it you know she was at home with the kids doing things at home mm -hmm. um, and then the at the school I went the, um, the like yeah the wife was very involved at home with all their kids they had a lot of kids like eight kids um, but she definitely didn't have a, a public role or a vocal role in, um, in Pat, like the, this priest was sort of the pastor of the community. So he would mm -hmm. be up there making announcements, you know, being a, a spiritual father for the community and he would hear confessions and all this stuff. Um, but she didn't have that same leadership role. She was definitely a big part of the community, just being a member of the community and um, definitely very influential, but not, not in the same way mm -hmm. as him. Yeah. Okay. That's what I would, that's just from my experience. Okay. And, but I, but I, I, sorry, go ahead. I'll go ahead, sorry. I just found that the, the wives of these priests are super faithful. Like they'd be daily at the liturgy praying and, you know, when their husband was up there on the altar, they were um, out in the pews praying. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Is it all right if we move to a different topic? Yeah. <laughs> I want to hear your thoughts on anxiety, all of you, because um, St. Paul is saying that he doesn't want us to be anxious, um, anxious about the world. He wants us to be anxious about the Lord. So he doesn't want negative anxiety, but he does want the positive kind of anxiety where we are looking forward to doing the things of the Lord and striving after holiness. 
But I find myself anxious about vocational discernment. Um, and I feel like I'm called to marriage, but not married and wanting to be open in case God's calling me to something else. Um, and that does create anxiety in my heart. And it, it seems like that kind of anxiety is the kind of anxiety St. Paul would not want me to have, but he didn't talk about situations like mine in his letter to the Corinthians. Um, so I feel like there's an anxiety that is the kind St. Paul doesn't want us to have. And yet I feel like it's natural or it follows from the state that I'm in of uncertainty and um, feeling like I'm not yet in the vocation that God wants me to end up in or have not embraced the vocation that God wants me to end up in. Mm. So I think my question for all of you is, um, does that sound like a healthy anxiety or an unhealthy anxiety? Mm. I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Paul talks elsewhere about anxiety, right? In Philippians? Yeah, Philippians, not be anxious, anxious for nothing. At all, but, per, but present your needs to God with, with petitions full of gratitude. So I, as a married woman, can feel not married, <laughs> not married, but, you know, as a grandmother, I can feel anxious any day I have to be grateful otherwise I'm taking all kinds of things upon myself that really belong to the Lord otherwise I'm God <laughs> but I'm not God he's God and I'm not so I'm telling you things I've just learned about myself over the past few years that I'm a burden bearer I can take some of my kids' anxieties upon myself as though I could solve their problems. I can take my own problems as though I could solve my own problems. And the fact is, I can't. So it's a challenge to present your needs to God with petitions full of gratitude. And then you, see, you start to see things happen because he isn't really in charge. And that goes for anything that goes, if you're praying for healing for someone, you start working really hard, praying really hard, this or that, who's doing the healing, you or God? You know what I mean? I'm just learning these things. I'm just on the, you know, in kindergarten with this stuff, but it's really transforming my life. And Paul is, he's got some wisdom there. I would say, I don't want you to be anxious at all. That's not the first time he said it, you know what I mean? So he's a good, I think he's a good example of that. That's the way he lived his life. So. That's wow. That's how that's how I've been trying to live. I think Padre Pio said, "Pray, trust, and don't worry." Um, mm -hmm. You know, so that I think there's a certain amount of that. Um, but then I'm thinking Saint Paul also, when he was describing his like sufferings, he said, "You know, he had he was shipwrecked all these times and." But he also said that he had the daily anxiety for the churches. So there's a certain amount of, you know, with responsibility, with, you know, if you're a father of children, if you're, you know, this, your life has anxieties that are some, somehow healthy or somehow normal. I would just say normal, um, natural to feel, you know, if you're not yet in a vocation, you're kind of still waiting and it's like not yet settled. So there is a certain anxiety that results from that. 
naturally, but I think by praying and by trusting in God, we realize that it'll be worked out. And so we can be less anxious through, through our trust, I think, you know. I think for anxiety, as someone who has an anxiety disorder, um, you said, is it a healthy anxiety or not a healthy anxiety? I mean, if some, if you're ruminating, like I tend to ruminate, um, that's mm -hmm. unhealthy. Um, when St. Paul was talking about anxiety, I believe he may just be talking about like, just like worry, you know, or be concerned about, so to speak, you know, like you know, concerned about the affairs of the Lord or concerned about something. Um, I, sounds like you're more just concerned about um, mm. what you want to do more than just, you know, having that anxious ruminating type of uh, feeling. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of what my answer would be to you as far as that goes. Um, I love what Mary said about anxiety because I can resonate with that a lot. I'm also learning. <laughs> so. Bernadette, yeah. do you have any thoughts on what makes for a, a healthy kind of anxiety versus an unhealthy kind of anxiety? Is it simply the rumination and how much something runs through your mind and like the feelings it causes in you? Or is there something else to it? I don't really know. I would say a healthier anxiety would be the one that St. Paul was talking about. Um, and, you know, it's, I don't know. I really, I don't have a true clear cut answer for that. I think there's just kind of like one of those, uh, it's one of those, one of these <laughs> charts, you know? Um, yeah. It's like I, I, I have anxiety about a lot of things and I have concerns about a lot of things. And um, sometimes my concerns turn to anxieties and sometimes my anxieties turn into more like, oh, I'm just a little bit concerned and I'm gonna let it go. And I'm, you know, I've, I've uh, just learned to just be powerless or just say, you know, God, you're in control and whatever happens, happens. That's, yeah. Amos, I, again, I may read way too much into each audience but, but in answer to your question, I was kind of fascinated that up through chapter three, it, it's somewhat of a balance between married and unmarried. And at, at, in chapter three, Paul talks about troubles of the body and a difficult love. But from then on, the anxiety he talks about is only the anxiety of the unmarried and the virgin and the continents for the kingdom, which I thought was kind of amusing because I'd say there's anxiety on both sides, the married side and the unmarried side. But he was, he was very clear and I just went and looked again. His discussion of anxiety is focused purely on unmarried and those who have chosen continents for the kingdom. He left behind the marriage with the trouble of the body, which Maybe it's not Manichaean, but it's interesting that for the married, their, their troubles, their anxiety not stated is the body, the union with husband and wife and all the, and talks about children and all that goes with marriage. And then there is this specific anxiety, which I guess he's an expert in of those who choose continence for the kingdom and the virgin or the unmarried life. I'm just stating that as a fact, that's the way I read it. But I also found that to be a little bit disheartening for someone who's reading it from one of the two perspectives and trying to gain insight on both sides of the house. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Nick, that insight, Nick. 
That is interesting. And I didn't pick that up when I read it through the first time. And everyone else, thanks for sharing your insights as well. Good question. Thank you for bringing that up. That good question. Um, what about this phrase? Well, we talking about um, how to please the Lord. So um, that seems to be the next part of this audience about um, that the celibacy comes from a relationship with God. Um, it's not only about that it allows the work, you know, someone to be more free, to have more time, to work that's not the only reason i mean that's a good thing it can be a good thing for the apostolate you know to to work hard and and to have that work that's a, that's a great thing but that ultimately stems from our relationship with god right like the relationship with god is first and prior and then because of that relationship with our father in heaven that impels someone to work for the kingdom right, to be fruitful. Um, and so, so this anxious person is anxious about how to please the Lord. And then at, later, St. Paul says to like, the married person is anxious about how to please his wife, right? And the wife, how to please her husband. Um, and their heart is divided, because they want to please the wife and they also want to serve the Lord. And I've, I've experienced that divided heart in many cases, like people talk about that um, where they would like to have more time to pray or more time to, you know, go on mission, but they also have the responsibility of their family and that family comes first and they actually serve the Lord through their family, even, you know, like, that since that is their primary responsibility towards their husband or wife um, and their children, this is, this is where they serve the Lord and they are building up the kingdom by serving their, by serving their family, um, by educating their kids, by being faithful to their spouse. Um, this is the work of the kingdom of God, right? This is building up the kingdom of God. Um, Oh, yeah. Do y'all have any thoughts? I was uh, thinking about, uh, someone had mentioned about St. Paul and his, um, his thoughts about um, celibacy and not marriage. And obviously that's all he knew. And that kind of, I don't know, gave me a little bit of a, a little bit of respect for what he did because um, as I looked at number nine, it said his apostolic zeal and most fruitful activity, um, what is contained in the Pauline motivation, so that you know, Pauline meaning St. Paul, for continence. So uh, to me, it's like, um, and even before that, you know, it's, it's just quoting what he said, this, the love that he had for celibacy is what motivated him to write that. So that kind of gave me a little bit more of a respect for that lifestyle that he chose. I was, um, my husband and I had our marriage, um, like a marriage therapy, premarital counseling by a married priest as well. Um, who was an Episcopalian priest. And so we were thinking, wow, we were like so lucky to have a married priest who can actually understand, you know, and get all, you know, everything and all that. So it was really cool. And at that time I was thinking, why can't all priests be married? That'd be so awesome. And as I 
read this audience, I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, now I have a deeper appreciation for the reason one, why would one, why one would choose celibacy and, you know, what, what the purpose behind it is more so, you know, um, not only for the whole, you know, the echo of the resurrection, but also for this reason that we're talking about today. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. I was thinking a um, couple of things like people who do choose celibacy um, and then enter a religious order seem to be the most successful, <laughs> you know, um, psychologically and I guess psychologically, I don't know. I think the diocesan priest seems to struggle the most, um, unless they're extremely outgoing and really, you know, reach out to people in the, the parish or wherever they are. Um, you know, like I, thank you for mentioning that Paul, you know, hung out with married couples, and I mean, obviously he was always around people, except when he was getting shipwrecked, you know, and stuff like that. But um, I mean, he obviously had so much insight into people's lives and, you know, Jesus sent out people two by two for a reason. He was traveling with a companion and, uh, you know, people hung on his neck crying, you know, when they had to leave each other and it just, it's so touching, you know, the way he must have really related deeply to people. And um, it's not that your life of celibacy is, an, is a life alone. That's not what he's talking about. So, and I think for, I think Bill Donahue's um, talk, like at, just about every opportunity, he was pulling out the that idea of, um, you know, the married person serving, like Nick, what you were saying, like serving the family and uh, the opportunities you have, like in just everyday life to serve your own family and, and in the ordinary day-to-day, -day, uh, what sometimes is drudgery and you know the flip side is I I and I heard this. Um, it wasn't anything Bill Donahue said, but it's something that real really struck me a few years ago. A priest that gave um, a talk, and in it he was talking about self-serving prayer, like uh, a woman who was uh, at Eucharistic adoration and she really would, should have been home with her kids. Mm. And that really struck me because, you know, there were really times when I really wanted to get out of the house, <laughs> you know, and uh, it, it, it can be a temptation just to, you know, mm -hmm. go spend some prayer time when I'm supposed to be washing the dishes. <laughs> so it's a, it's a balance. So that's mm. all I have to say. But Mary, those were some great insights. And everyone else, you had some great things to say tonight. I unfortunately have to drop. Okay. But, okay. Hi, Amos, thanks for being open and sharing like that. That was really beautiful. Thank you. As always, you. you're, you're yeah. amazing. Well, maybe we should wrap up anyway. Um, we're about out of time, but thank you all. Um, so let's pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.